This next section is going to be all about layers. You've probably either heard about layers or have used them already because they're one of Photoshop's most powerful tools. The layer palette on the left side of the screen represents your layer stack. You can think of this as a physical stack of clear transparencies, each of which can contain information or drawings. So you see here I've separated the triangle, the circle, and the rectangle under their own layers. So you could see the flexibility that this would give a painter that a traditional painter really would never have access to. You can work on each object on its own and still have the freedom to move them about. On the bottom of the layer palette, you have buttons that will create new layers or create layer groups. Now you can think of a layer group as a bundle of layers. So if I select my three primary layers, and drag them onto the word group one. Now I can work with them as a unit. I can move them together and I can even free transform them as a unit. And also once you've got a group, you can collapse or expand that group on your layer palette for organization. It's also important to note that the layer order does matter. This is why thinking of your layer stack as a physical group of transparencies can really help you out. Because in this case, if I want to have the rectangle on top of the triangle, just moving the layer around won't cut it. It's going to always stay behind the triangle. So if I wanted to put the triangle below the other shapes, I would have to lower it in a layer order. And you do this by grabbing the name of the layer and letting go in the spot in the stack that you would like. So you notice now the triangle is behind the rectangle and the circle is on top. So at this point you might be wondering what's the practical application of using layers in a painting? Well one thing that a painter would be benefited by is what's called the blending mode on a layer. So I'm going to make a new layer with the default normal style. And above the word normal I'm going to paint with a medium blue color. So it looks like what you'd expect. It's opaque paint. Now I'm going to paint that same color on a new layer that's set to multiply. And you can see the difference. Notice how this has a glaze effect to it. In this way a multiply layer can be thought of as a glaze layer and would act a bit like thin oils or potentially watercolor paints. So when you're making strokes, it's nice to think about whether you want opaque paint, which would be a normal layer, or glazing paint, which would be a multiply layer. So you've seen some of the positives that extra layers can provide. They can give you nice versatility, and they can also be set to different blending modes. Well, the downside of layers is when you get too many of them. So you can see here I've made about 30 layers. Now I've got a scroll bar to work with on my layer palette, and the layers could become really hard to keep track of. Additionally, as your composition gets really big and more and more layers are involved, it becomes a giant file that can be really hard for your computer to work with. Especially if you've got an older computer or not a lot of RAM, you really want to avoid having too many layers. So it's up to each artist to figure out the proper balance for their workflow between just enough layers to keep you flexible but not too many so your computer gets bogged down. So for my purposes, I've come up with a technique that I call temp layers. So the idea of temp layers is to generally keep my layer stack short, but if I need to do something risky, like paint this big gradation of blue, I'll make a new layer temporarily, shape it, and then when I'm happy with it, merge it down. So I begin by making a shape, that I'd paint way outside of the lines, but focus on the gradation. I'd then erase to define a crisp edge. And in this way I get both a smooth transition as well as a sharp edge, something that you'd have trouble doing if you were painting on a single layer. And when I'm happy with it, I'd flatten that layer back down into my stack. So let's take a look at temp layers in practice. 
So what I'm going to do here is render the chest plate because right now it's left unpainted. So my first step is to create a new layer and to render the highlights way outside of the lines. This will make sure that I get a nice soft gradation. And I'm keeping in mind where my light source is. And I'll select a soft eraser to recede the back into shadow a bit more. Okay, so that's the first step. The rendering is there, but it's not in the right sort of boundaries. So at this point, I switch to the eraser tool and get the hard eraser. And I start to remove what I don't need. Okay, there you go. So I'll hide it so you can see what it was I did. And I can tell I've missed a little erasing. There we go. Now maybe if I want this bevel to fall off a bit, I'll use the soft eraser and soften out that transition as the metal rolls over the edge. So at this point, if I'm happy with it, I'll use the merge down command and get rid of that temp layer. So I made a new layer, painted outside of the lines, and then merged down when I was happy. Another really handy use of the temp layers is to separate the idea of large scale value change, like the surface that I've made right here, from small scale surface detail. Say I wanted to put on some panel lines to help define the form and add some interest. This would be something that I do after I had done the initial large scale rendering. So I'm working on a new layer here, just like before, and I can put in any sort of detailing I want to do. Erasing out as I go. But I can do that confidently because I've already established the overall lighting and form. And now I'm just doing a little detailing. So working in these passes through using temp layers is a really great way to make sure that it's working before you add too much detail. Now to wrap things up, like in the previous videos, I've included a worksheet to help practice that idea of temp layers, because this is a bit abstract and it's probably something you've never done before. So these organic shapes are a great way to give it a try. So I'll do the second one on the list here, just to show you an example. So I'll sample from the color provided. And I'll focus on that dark to light gradation. And it might help to set the flow down to about 50%. So using the soft round brush, I make it dark at the bottom. Soft round eraser to lighten it up at top. And when I'm happy with the rendering, it's time to get the hard eraser and to start carving out my edges. And you can see as I do this that I'm actually using those keyboard shortcuts to great advantage. The fact that I'm able to shrink and enlarge my master diameter of the brush as well as pan and zoom are really allowing me to focus on the task at hand. And I'm not worried about stopping what I'm doing to go open up a menu or to hit a button. Okay, and now it matches the example. So go ahead and give these a try, and probably by the end of the worksheet, you'll have a much stronger grasp of this concept.